everyone. I would I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Tamara Emineger, who is currently a postdoc at uh, Lund University in Sweden, working with Professor Stefan Bench. Uh, before she moved to Sweden, she did her PhD at the Swiss Ornithological Institute in Sempa. Um, and uh, she's going to talk to us today about some uh, avian blood parasite research, uh, specifically uh, how that relates to migratory birds. So thank you very much, Tamara, and take it away. Thank you so much, Will, for inviting me and uh, everyone else for giving me the opportunity to uh, present my work. So um, I'm going to talk about like mostly my the work I did during my PhD, but um, because it is such a long slot, <laughs> such such a long opportunity to talk about my stuff, it's mainly uh, also a bit about my journey, how I how I got here and um, what I'm doing here now. So. Um, it's going to be mostly about avian blood parasites of birds, but like my whole journey mostly began um, as being uh, a primary school teacher. So I was first a primary school teacher and then I started my studies and working as a secondary school teacher all in Switzerland. Um, during my biology studies, I started with a migration research. So I was just looking at uh, these nightingales for my master thesis because I was teaching, I was not doing field work. So people just handed me their data and I looked where these nightingales from three different populations went. And the aim of the whole thing was to look at where do they go on their autumn and spring migration and especially on their spring migration, which kind of um, environmental conditions do they face when they migrate? And also how did these conditions change? So in the right plot, you can see um, the different breeding sites of these birds, the different spring uh, stopover sites and the non-breeding sites in Africa and the sites that belong to the same individual, they are connected with these dotted lines. And with the color code, I show how did the spring phenologies change over the last 30 years at these places? So did they um, get advanced? That would be blue and the minus or did they get later so did, did they delay which would be in red and depending on the combination of delayed and advanced uh, spring phenologies you can imagine that the birds face different risks of mismatch so if a bird starts at the site in africa where the the phenology has advanced and then has to end up somewhere where it has been delayed there is a risk of mismatch that it will not reach uh, the breeding site in a condition or in a, in the place uh, in the phenology where it is good to breed for it. So this was the aim of my master thesis to look at these different uh, risks of mismatching along the migratory routes of these nightingales. Then at the end of my master, um, my supervisors uh, asked me whether I'm interested in, in parasites, which first I thought like, uh, I don't know, parasites really. Um, but then still, uh, my supervisors convinced me that it's an interesting topic and I started a PhD at the UKH of Zurich and the Swiss Ornithological Institute about these parasites and first I just had to learn like what are these blood parasites really and um, what do they do to the birds. So to also give you a bit of background uh, in case you're, it's not your field, um, all these avian malaria and related parasites they get transmitted by diptera vectors. So uh, uh, an insect bites a bird and it transmits um, uh, a parasite, which then either in the blood or in the tissue develops with asexual um, reproduction. And at some point it pops up in the blood. It can get transmitted again with an insect bite. And within the insect, the whole sexual reproduction takes place first in the gut, and then it moves to the salivary glands where it can be transmitted again to another bird. What I am looking at mostly is um, blood samples of birds. So I'm looking at the blood stages and it's very important to, to know that um, if you look at the blood stages or if you look at the blood sample, it doesn't mean um, you see everything because there is the whole tissue part that we, that we cannot see. So if you think a bird is infected or non-infected, it's not the whole truth. But still, it is something that we can easily attain and we can um, look at some symptoms. It's always people ask oh, malaria that sounds so 
horrible. So what are the symptoms that birds have? And it really much depends on the stage of the infection. So if the transmission takes place, there is a first primary infection where the infection intensity increases and uh, afterwards there can be a very long chronic phase. In, the parasites can also disappear again or they can reappear after they have disappeared with the so-called relapse. And um, most of the symptoms that, that we know from experimental studies, anemia, loss of appetite, that they are not moving a lot, they have reduced mobility, the plumage can be ruffled, there can be some weight loss and there can also be enlarged spleens. This is mostly from the primary infection stage. Not so much is known uh, about what are the symptoms during chronic or what are the symptoms during a phase of relapse. So when we look at migration and these diseases, <clears throat> it is very interesting to look at different mechanisms that um, where migration and infections are uh, interacting. So there are some mechanisms when migrating birds are on their journeys that facilitate infections and other mechanisms are hampering infections. So a bird, typically we can look at it starting from a breeding ground. It leaves that breeding ground it's a so-called migratory escape. So it can escape from a place where there is a high pathogen pressure. And when it's on the way, um, there is something that happens that is called immunomodulation. So the immune system can often be reduced uh, because so much of the energy, so much of the resources have to be invested in migrating so that there is not a lot of resources left for the immune reaction, which might facilitate infections. At stopover sites, many birds, maybe not so much passerines, but maybe um, water birds, other species, they uh, aggregate in multi-species um, groups, sometimes can be quite dense. And this is also facilitating transmission, maybe not so much of the vector transmitted disease, but other um, pathogens like uh, directly transmitted um, influenza virus. Then uh, there is also so-called migratory culling, which means that uh, because birds are facing uh, a high um, energetic demand during migration, the ones that are infected maybe die with a higher rate, which means they are dying out of the population, which could reduce the prevalence within a breeding population. Once the birds come back, the ones which were infected are maybe dead, they don't return, um, which would which can influence the disease dynamics within a breeding population. When they are at the wintering grounds, <clears throat> birds get exposed to novel parasites that they are maybe not um, adapted to. So all these um, processes you can see can either facilitate or hamper infections and that makes migra migratory birds an interesting um, system to look at infections, infectious disease. Birds are also often described as um, being spreader for disease, but there are uh, many things that have to be fulfilled that a migratory animal can spread parasites. Mainly, they spread parasites more than resident birds if they carry many parasites. There are some indications for that, that they have more parasites, more diverse parasites than resident, resident hosts. And um, if infected hosts are still able to migrate, so if they still migrate, um, as if they were non-infected or similar to uninfected host animals, um, they can actually spread the disease. It's also a part of uh, what we were looking at in our project. So in our uh, avian malaria project and the migration uh, group of the Swiss Ornithological Institute, we had, um, and also like which my PhD was a part of, we had several research questions which were in these interactions between uh, infections and migrations. One part was, how does host migration uh, influence the parasite infection? Is host migration a cause for parasite infections? There we looked at different um, bird species with different migration strategies, uh, which happened to be the fully resident uh, house sparrow, the partial migratory tree sparrow, and the obligate migratory Spanish sparrow to compare uh, these birds with a different migration strategy, how they differ in the parasitism they have. <laughs> And then we wanted to see what are the consequences of infections for migratory birds. So if they have an infection, how does it influence their physiology, mainly metabolic rates and endurance? 
how does it influence their activity budgets, um, how they are resting, how they are migrating, the speed, the flight takes, stuff like this, and then also their migration patterns. So do in fact individuals have different temporal schedules? Do they use other routes? Or is it actually pretty similar how they migrate if they are infected or not? So in this first project at the Sparrows, um, we compared their prevalence. So how many individuals are infected? We also compared parasitemia. This is the intensity of infection when you count the infected erythrocytes under the microscope. And then we were also looking at parasite diversity. Uh, in this case, it was the number of genetic lineages. This was mainly a, a project that we started because we were doing a lot of field work in collaboration with um, a research group from Bulgaria. This research took place uh, in the Danube River uh, floodplain, where we were catching great tweet warblers for a tracking study. And because there were many sparrows also in the nets, we decided to uh, compare the parasites and the metabolic rates of these sparrows as well. And um, we had a hypothesis that prevalence might differ mainly between the migratory um, Spanish sparrow and the two other sparrow species, but uh, maybe also between the partial and the resident, resident species. We thought that maybe intensity could be higher in a migratory species because um, it has to invest uh, a lot of resource, maybe not so much during the breeding season, but we thought probably that the two resident or the resident and the partial migrant can be pretty similar. And then because of all the other studies that have been done in this regard, um, we thought that the intensity is gonna be higher in the migratory species because it goes to so many different places um, where the other two species don't go and it faces different vector pools, different parasites um, that occur there. So we looked at the, the prevalence of these three species and we found that the highest prevalence was in the house sparrow. So these three species were more or less sympatricly breeding in this area in Bulgaria. So we thought that, yeah, maybe the prevalence um, is higher in this resident species because of its uh, resident lifestyle. But it was quite surprising that the parasitemia was pretty similar. So we didn't find a significant difference at all um, in the parasitemia of so the infection intensity, you see that there are very few, very intensely infected individuals, maybe one or two per species um, that had high infection intensities of maybe one to 2% of the um, erythrocytes infected. And all the other ones had quite low intensities. So we were looking at many uh, chronic infections in this case. The infection um, diversity though was really higher in the Spanish sparrow. So what we see here is the number of lineages that we found in the three species. And you also see that they, we had a little bit different uh, sample sizes, but even if we calculate the number of lineages we found per infected individual, it was still that Spanish sparrows had the highest infection um, diversity. You see that they share some of the lineages. There are some lineages which are really common to uh, plasmodium lineages, GRW11 and SGS1 were shared among all three species. And then the house sparrow and the Spanish sparrow had another um, plasmodium lineage they shared. So this was this little study about the sparrows in, um, in Bulgaria. And then many of the other um, research we did was also done in this region. Uh, in collaboration uh, with other research groups where we looked at the physiology first. So the first question when it comes to the consequences of infection on, on migration performance was, do avian blood parasites compromise the aerobic capacity of their hosts? So does um, a parasite influence the way they can transport uh, oxygen? So if you look at how the oxygen is transported through the body. Uh, the oxygen is taken up by the lungs. It is transported through blood vessels where it is brought through the blood circuit to the muscle cells. And in the muscle cells, um, the oxygen is used for, um, for example, moving. If you 
think about the infections, we have some blood parasites which are stuck. So they somehow uh, are thought to influence the, um, the way these, these um, oxygen, this oxygen can be transmitted. So we were speculating that the parasite in this, um, in these erythrocytes influences the way that the oxygen can be transported through the body. That's why we did uh, ex experimental inoculations. We took a local common low pathogenic plasmodium strain and we inoculated this to great reed warblers. And then we did repeated measurements of resting and maximal metabolic rates. So the resting metabolic rate is measured when they are resting overnight, mostly sleeping, they should be post-absorptive, so they should not be um, busy with uh, digesting food. And they are in a temperature where they basically just have to maintain their basic metabolism. In the peak metabolic rate, though, they are moving. So they are challenged to do exercise. And there we can see how much oxygen do they consume when they, when they are in a state where they have to do exercise similar to when they are migrating. So in this graph, we can uh, look at the resting metabolic rate in the lower panel and maximum rate of metabolic rate in the upper panel. And it's always the comparison between the infected and the non-infected birds in gray and in red during the three phases of the experiment. It was pre-inoculation to see if there was any difference between these birds before we started the experiment. Then in early post-inoculation, which was thought to be the acute phase, and then in the late post-inoculation, so the chronic phase, where the infection intensity already dropped again. And in these three phases, we did not find differences in the metabolic rates, neither in the resting metabolic rate nor in the maximum. Even though we are not sure that this means none of the infections can have an influence because we took this low pathogenic strain to not risk the experiment, to not lose birds during the process, so we did not reach really high infection intensities, even in the early post-inoculation, also in the acute phase. But what we found, and what was interesting, that the seasonal increase in the metabolic rates was done for all the birds. So it, whether they were infected or non-infected, they were able to increase their metabolic rate over the course of the experiment. And we saw the same effect in birds that were not part of the experiment, but that were part of um, the, the other part of the study. So during the same time where we did the experiment, we also caught wild, wild individuals with natural infections. And the late breeding, the post breeding and the migration phase that you can see in this uh, left plot is more or less um, the same like the pre inoculation, the early post inoculation and the late post inoculation uh, phase of the experimental birds. So also these birds increased their um, metabolic rates over time. Also there we did not find a big infect, uh, a bit of effect of the infections on metabolic rates, but here you can see that this is a natural process. So it means these birds were, um, were preparing for migration. They were increasing their metabolic rates that they are able to migrate and also infected birds um, infected birds were able to do that. This means also infected birds are able to prepare and perform migration, which is um, uh, interesting to see, especially in um, regard of uh, migratory birds to be spreader of disease. In the next part, um, where we were looking at activity budgets, um, we were looking at the effect of infections on the activity of birds. And if, this, if there is an influence of infection on activity, does it change migration timing? And is it depending on the intensity of infection? This was done with the geolocation study I already mentioned. So we were collaborating with people from Czech Republic, from, from uh, the European part of Russia, let's say, and uh, Bulgaria. And um, in this geolocation study, we were putting geolocators, we were looking where these birds go, but we were also looking at what was their infection prior to migration and after migration, what was the infection status, the blackbirds are uninfected, the gray 
dots are um, infections which were unknown, which could not really be um, detected well. Blue um, but, um, dots are plasmodium infections, red dots are hemoproteus infections, and the um, purple dots are uh, mixed infections with two different genera, so with the hemoproteus and the plasmodium infection involved. And you can see the infection intensity uh, is quite variable, so it changes um, over the course of a migration season. So we were correlating the prior to migration infection intensity to everything that was involved in autumn migration. And then we took the information from after migration to everything uh, during spring migration so that we at least have a, a kind of more clear idea uh, what was going on during these migrations. So what do these loggers do? The, the loggers that we used, they do um, record light they record pressure, temperature, activity, and pitch. So with these different measures, we can use different things. So the light is used for positioning. With the sunrise and sunset, you can calculate how um, these birds, uh, where these birds go with the light level geolocation, as it, it's done uh, by many groups nowadays. And then, uh, which is a bit more new, uh, the pressure and the temperature can be used for flight heights and the activity and pitch can be used for behavior. So we can um, look at these different uh, measurements and we can categorize which are um, times of resting. We can categorize whether it's active, but maybe not flying here in green. We can say that they were flying, but not migrating, which is shown here in blue. And then we can show um, prolonged flights, which means they are migratory flights, which are shown here in red. And the hypothesis was um, that we can uh, look at the infections delaying migration timing. So maybe birds which are infected, they start their migrations later. We thought maybe it leads to shorter flight bouts because they don't have the same exercise endurance. They maybe have a longer resting, Maybe they cannot fly at high altitudes because they are um, lacking enough uh, oxygen. And um, the results showed that they indeed have a delayed timing of autumn migration, but they could somehow compensate that again during the rest of the, of the migration. So here you always see infection intensity on the x-axis and the timing um, on the y-axis. And autumn migration is delayed, but all the other periods of the annual cycle are not influenced by infection or intensity. This might be the case because they somehow um, compensate in other stages. Uh, maybe they, they fly a bit longer. So here we show the mean flight bout duration. So the flight bout duration for one of these um, migratory flights that you saw on the activity. So they have a bit longer flight bouts and they have shorter maximum resting durations. So the long restings that other birds do um, during um, between consecutive flight nights, these were reduced for um, intensely infected birds, especially for, um, for birds with mixed infections. So this was the, the activity logger story. And then we also have a, a small study that is just looking at migration timing. So the spring migration timing, instead of, instead of following a whole bird over its annual cycle with the logger, you could also say, okay, I do it the other way around. I stand still at the rigging station. I see which birds are migrating through. I take a blood sample and, um, when the birds are flying through, I look at how prevalence changes. Because if you think of a, a passage site, like for example, a Mediterranean stopover site, where birds come in from their wintering sites, they stop and they go on to their breeding sites that we don't know. If there is a difference in the migration timing between uninfected 
and infected birds, let's say infected birds are coming a bit later, you have an increase of prevalence over time. So that was our hypothesis when we were looking at this data from this uh, Mediterranean island called Ventotene. There were four, four bird species we were looking at. Uh, here you can see in, in red the pike flycatcher, in yellow the barn swallow, then a common red start in blue and a wing check in green. And you can see that for three out of four of these species, there is a increased uh, increasing prevalence over time. You can also see that prevalence is quite high for wind jets in general. Um, in the background, you see this gray uh, lines. The gray lines show the overall model, which is modeled for all the four species together. So there you can see wind jets have a, have a higher prevalence in general, but the increase is not um, significant for these species. So these were um, four studies that I did in my uh, PhD thesis. And um, then my postdoc journey began. And um, as many postdocs uh, experience, this can be a journey that is uh, long and also a bit exhausting. I have the luck that after my PhD, I was employed for for uh, two more years in part-time in the Swiss Ornithological Institute to finish some of the projects that we started. So I could continue to look at more migration patterns and more host parasite interactions. Um, one was a, a collaboration study about sand markings, where we looked at different sand marking populations. We compared their migrations because these sand markings were also studied with geolocators. We could see where they go, how much time they spend during different times of their annual cycle. So for example, how much time do they spend in a non-breeding, here shown in blue? How much time do they spend on migration in brown and green? How much time do they spend in the breeding site? And you can see this for the German for the, and for the Hungarian populations that uh, we studied together with Tibor Sepp, that maybe some of you people know um, in Hungary. And then we also had um, a study site on Antikythera, which is a Greek island, on spring migration. Uh, and there, the, in, the, the interesting parts of the parasite study came because we looked at the prevalence of this, but we especially also looked at the infection intensity. And what you can see here again is that infection intensities are often quite low, but for a few birds, there are also high infection intensity of over 5%. So over 5% of the erythrocytes that we looked at in the microscope were infected with parasites, even on passage. So here you can see the different breeding populations, two German populations and the Hungarian population, but you can also see um, this, the data from the passage site in Greece. And also here you can see that there were some birds which were intensely infected. So it seems there are some infected birds that can travel even with high infection intensities. So either with an ongoing primary infection or with a relapse of an ongoing infection, they can migrate. And that is uh, quite interesting to see. Not many people look at parasitemia and I think it is um, very worthwhile, even though there are many um, good molecular and sophisticated molecular uh, methods to still look at some microscopy slides to see what is actually going on in these birds. I also was involved in a big bee eater project, in a long term project where we looked at um, birds from Portugal and Germany. So, Portugal is a, is a population of bee eaters that is long established, um, like in many parts of Europe. There were always bee eaters around there, but Germany is a population where um, they started to breed in the 90s. And it's quite interesting to look at their parasites um, because it can be quite different in recently established population, which kind of parasites you have. You see the um, prevalence is a bit lower in Germany and also the composition is different. So what you can see here is which parasites do um, German and Portuguese birds share and which parasites do they have on their own. With H, it's always Hemoproteus. And with P, um, I marked the plasmodium lineages. And you can see that they share many parasite lineages in these two, two populations, which are quite far away. So these six lineages, oops, 
the six lineages in the middle, they share, but the relative abundance of the lineages are quite different. So the Portuguese population seems to have um, more hemoproteus infections, while plasmobium infections are more um, prevalent in the German population. So it's quite interesting to see and to compare that. And uh, in this publication, we also related this to the different histories these populations have. So there could be good reasons why a population in Germany has more plasmodium infections, which are more generalist parasites that maybe were, were spilled over from other bird species. And in Portugal, where the bee eaters are uh, as a breeding birds since a long time, that they have more hemoproteus infections, which are um, parasites that are specialized on their certain host species. Also here we looked at infection intensities. So if you're interested in parasitemia of these birds, you can look up in these publications also lineage specific intensities and how the different lineages um, were expressed in the two populations. One of the most recent things that we were able to publish um, still from the time during my PhD was um, this study about the migration um, physiology of passerines. It was also done on uh, Ventutene as a follow-up study. We went on Ventutene and measured the metabolic rates of migrating passerines. So really uh, compared to the study that was done in Bulgaria, where we were looking at the birds during the breeding season and in the preparation to the migration here, we were catching the birds out of the migration wave and compared the uh, resting metabolic rate the maximal metabolic rate and the time until exhaustion. So the kind of endurance that these birds have. Um, and we were comparing long and short distance migrants. So we had two short distance migrant species, the, um, the robin, the European robin and the black red start. And then two long distance migrants, the common red start and the wind jet. We chose the species because they are generally quite closely related. They're all small thrush-like um, species, and um, but they have very distinct migration patterns. Interestingly, there was uh, not a lot of difference in the metabolic rates, but there was a big difference in the time until exhaustion. So long distance migrants have a longer exercise endurance. It seems that they are able to um, to endure exercise for a longer time um, in this experimental setting. And because I'm interested in the parasites, we also checked these birds for parasite infections. And we found that the infection has uh, influence on the hemoglobin content. So here you can see um, infected and non-infected birds compared and the infected birds had um, lower hemoglobin content, which in turn also had an effect on their metabolic rates not on the base metabolic rate, so the metabolic rate during resting, but the maximal metabolic rate and the time until exhaustion. So it seems um, heavily infected birds have lower hemoglobin contents, which then also has a negative impact on their um, aerobic capacity. So after this um, first postdoc time in Switzerland, the time, uh, like most of the projects were were finished. Some of them are still going on, but um, I had the feeling that it is time to go somewhere else. And I came here to Lund. I applied for money from the Swiss National Science Foundation to do a project with Stefan. And the main idea was to work on the Malawi database. The Malawi database is a global public database where people uh, like William, for example, <laughs> if they do research about um, I mean, malaria parasites, we all try to um, prepare our data in a way that we can put it in this public database, that it's um, there for everyone to look up. It's genetic parasite lineages, like I showed them before. They have a, a specific name. You give them a name and you, you compare uh, or you, you um, describe in which kind of hosts you find which parasitic lineage. And then um, people can look up in different report tables of this database, which kind of parasites have been found in which bird species. So it can look something like this. So this is part of the, of the um, bee eater data that I showed before that you can look up in this table. So you have information about the parasite, 
which parasite genus it was, which lineage name you have information about the bird at the site, and then you know how many were found, how many were tested, and if the if the um, data is published, you can also find the reference name. This is, it's a very nice um, thing to have this database because people can can look up prior information. So, for example, when we did our study about the great wheat worker, we could look up what is the prevalence, what is the diversity, um, so that we can plan our study. We know how many birds do we have to catch, how many geolocators do we have to deploy, that in the end we can compare a reasonable number of infected and uninfected birds. You can also um, use this data as accompanying data. So if you do a study and you check um, which parasites are, do I find in my um, in my local uh, great tips, you can go to the database and you can check where did other people find the same lineages and which host species did they find them to have a comparison. And such a database is for sure also a nice resource for data to do meta-analysis. So this was a study that has been done where people looked at um, the, the distribution of all these different hemoproteus, parahemoproteus, plasmodium, and leucocytosome species or lineages, how they are um, distributed over the whole world, and also which kind of local climatic conditions maybe influence the distribution or prevalence of these different parasites. So what I applied my money for is to work on the database in a very technical way. So what I want to do, you see um, a kind of a simulation or um, a state of the art. What I want to do is like to have a map where people can easily check where did people already study parasites. Um, most, of the, most of the web page will probably look the same like it is looking now, but um, it is uh, important that uh, it also gets more accessible for the general public. So especially the map part, I think, would be quite nice for people that maybe don't have an in-depth interest and don't want to look at the parasite lineages, but maybe they want to see where do, do these avian malaria parasites get studied. And then for the, mostly for the researchers, what I want to do is to have a, a, a better system how to look for data, how to filter data, because now um, you have to download, everyone that already worked with Malawi data knows, you have to download the whole table and then you have to look for the stuff. And with a way like you, I show you in this um, uh, filterable tables, it would be nice. You could just look, okay, how species, um, long tailed it, I can search and I can see who well, already found parasites in the species. So this is an ongoing thing that I hope um, we will be able to implement soon. Uh, and another thing I'm working on is um, maybe something I don't have a lot of time for to still talk about, but maybe many of you know the Hamilton-Sack hypothesis. So um, Marlene Sack and William Hamilton, they raised the hypothesis uh, in the 80s that um, there is an association between blood parasite infection incidents and this display of uh, males, so male brightness and male song characteristics. Uh, this also means that these characteristics and the infections must be host species specific. So if you say that there is um, a correlation between infections and um, secondary characteristics. You can do this either on an intraspecific way. I mean, many studies of the Hamilton Sack hypothesis were like within a species, like for example, here the barn swallow. You look at how long are, for example, tail, tip, ta tail tips, and then you say there is a correlation in one or the other way. But there is also this interspecific way, and that was the original way they did it. They looked at how striking, how colorful, how um, bright is bird plumage, and then how does this relate to the to the uh, incidence of parasites? So here, for example, a very dull great wheat warbler compared to a very colorful bee eater, um, they would have different predicted incidences of parasite infections. So is it really a host-specific characteristic to have 
or not to have many parasites? Or is it mostly determined by sampling site? So this um, can be tested with, with data from Malawi. So what I did is I went to the Malawi database and I looked for host species that were sampled at sites that were far enough apart so that I can see whether it's more a host species specific trait to have a certain prevalence or to have a certain lineage diversity or whether it's actually really a host specific trait. And that's what I'm doing at the moment. So I, I look at the host specificity, specificity of uh, prevalence and diversity as estimated from the Malawi data. And I wanna see how do these molecular prevalence and diversity measures correlate with bird brightness indices. And also how do our molecular measures correlate with the historical values that they have from microscopy. And uh, I got the data set from uh, Andrew Reed and Paul Harvey, where they have this historical um, microsc microsc microscopy values and where they also have the bird brightness indices, but these are very old files. So this, um, these uh, studies were all done in the 80s. So I got files which were last opened um, with, with uh, programs, statistical programs that do not exist anymore. <laughs> so it's binary data. If you just open it in a in a um, in a notepad, you can see some kind of hieroglyphs. So I found a person who is very good um, with doing this. <laughs> I call it data archaeology, and uh, with together with him, we were able to um, to reconstruct some of these data. So we we found some data columns again. We found some values again, and now I can start really analyzing. Uh, and correlating this data. So we also hope that in the end, we will be able to put this historical data on an uh, open database where the other people can use it so that no one has to go through this um, process again of reconstructing the data. So if you are interested in such kind of old um, bird brightness data and old prevalence data, you can also contact me and I can uh, show you where you can find it. So, this is a process that is still to be continued. I don't know where I will end up in this, after this stay here. So um, I'm always happy to, to talk about I, research ideas or collaborations uh, if someone is interested, um, either through William or just um, find me somewhere on the social media or find me somewhere in the research portal of Un Lund University so that we can get in touch and, and talk about it. So um, yeah. I want to thank all my funding agencies and uh, Swiss Ornithological Institute, Lund University for supporting me, uh, also ETH for supporting me doing my PhD. Yeah, and the funding for my current stay is from the SNF. So I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much, Tamara. That was a fantastic talk, really, really informative stuff. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I guess you can uh, unmute yourself and ask away. Um, uh, whilst people think, I have a, I have a question for you. Um, so I, I was interested in that study. Um, I wasn't sure if it had been published yet or not, um, where you had the four different passerines. Uh, that was the, the wind chats and the pipe fly catches on that Mediterranean island, and you showed prevalence increasing across the season. Yeah. Uh, did you look at uh, how diversity changed across the season of, of the different lineages? Uh, were there any trends there? Um, this was. Uh, so did I? Am I still sharing now, or am I not sharing anymore? I don't know. I tried to uh, go back to the slide. It's sort of sharing. It might just be frozen. But. Well, that is unfortunate. No, it's okay. So this was the, oh, maybe it's coming now. Something is moving. Still black. So the study about increasing prevalence over the spring migration. Yes. Um, that was a study 
I can tell you how um, how we can, how we got there, and then then I, then you will realize um, why we don't have this information. So this was a data set that has been collected by a diploma student of um, of one of the PIs at uh, Swiss Archaeological Institute, and they only uh, looked at slides. So okay. they just looked at um, at slides under the microscope and they did not really determine the parasites. So there we also don't have uh, infection intensities, or at least the infection intensities I found in the data tables, they were not reliable. So they were, they were not values that I could make sense of. That's why I didn't use them. So I just used infected or uninfected as an infection status. That's why we only work with prevalent. Okay. Would you expect any uh, things to change across the season? Yeah, it depends. I mean, one of the hypotheses is that they really, the, the infection, the infected birds are delayed. And um, then I would not, then I would not really expect a change in the diversity uh, a lot, but it could also be that different bird populations fly through in sequence and different populations have different prevalences. So it, that it's not really that infection, infected birds per population are delayed, but maybe bird populations that breed more in the north have higher prevalence and they are the ones that come through late or the other way around, I don't know, but that is from different populations. And then I would expect a big difference also in, that, in their diversities. Okay. Uh, Zoltan, I think you have a question. Yes, thank you. And thanks a lot for the really interesting talk. You just answered one of my questions about the latitudinal variation in infection rates. I was curious about if there is any study showing that, for example, it's costly to migrate to north, not only because it's more energetically expensive, but maybe there are more parasites that you can get infected with. But apparently there is no information on this yet. Is that right? There are some studies and what we tried here, for example, because we wanted to outrule this option, we wanted to have more proof for that it's really a, a delay in, in, um, in migration. So the only thing we could do is to see if there was a change in wing length uh, over time, because if there would be different populations involved, we would also expect uh, wing length to change or to vary over time and there was no such effect. So. We, we some, I mean, we cannot completely rule it out, but um, still this was more another indication that, that maybe there is a delay going on. There are some studies, um, especially also the one I showed from this meta-analysis about the uh, Malawi data, where they looked at, um, at the different um, biogeographic regions, but also the different latitudes. And in this publication, um, you can also find this information about the latitudinal distribution because it's very different between the different parasite genera. So Plasmodium hemoproteus and Leucocytosome parasites have different insect vectors that transmit the parasite. And this also makes their distribution over the latitudinal gradient very different. And it's very interesting to look at the maps that they did in this um, publication. All right, thank you. And I have another question. if. It's possible. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm curious about the longitudinal changes and variation, like within an individual over time, does prevalence or the diversity of parasites do those change and whether migrants cope with higher prevalence better or worse than resident birds? Uh, fantastic question. <laughs> um, we, we have a data set where we could look at that. So the Bee Eater um, project, this long-term project uh, within the German populations, we already do this um, geolocator and sampling study um, since more than 10 years. So because these are birds that are quite long-lived, we have already many birds that we caught um, many times over the years. So we have infection histories where we can look at how consistent, how individually consistent is infection status. So once you're infected, you stay infected. Can you lose infection again? At least apparently lose infection again, because we just look at the peripheral blood. And also how um, consistent is which lineage they have. So basically, do they get a lineage 
transmit it early in their life and then they keep it? Or do other lineages come on top of it? And the other thing that I'm very interested in is how individually consistent is infection intensity. So are you an individual that has a high infection intensity because you just, you're just either not able to really suppress the infection intensity or because you maybe you can allow it to have a high infection intensity because you can just cope with it um, also over a long term? Or are you just... Um, is it more depending on when exactly you sample the bird and maybe in one year you get a high infection because it's doing a relapse and in another year it ha it's having a low. I mean, we're, also, we're always capturing them in the same, more or less same time of their annual cycle um, during uh, the late chick rhythm phase because that is the time where you can put gel locators on them without uh, interrupting their breeding. But still, there might be some slight variation. So uh, it will be very interesting to look in this, into this data more in depth to see how individually consistent these are. But because you need long-term studies and you need a quite long-lived bird species, I think it's not something that is done very often. So I was just talking to a colleague today. She was doing something similar with chickadees and um, the chickadees are smaller, they are short-lived. So what she often has is one or two consecutive years um, where you have a where you have this data, but um, oftentimes you don't have a third year where you can catch this chickadee again to see does it still have the same infection or not. I don't know, maybe maybe Will has has <laughs> something from uh, more long. I mean, for, uh, we were talking about it when when you were uh, when you were both in Bielefeld. Um, for example, something like oyster catcher would be fan would be fantastic study species to do something like this because it is anyways quite interesting what, what you found from oyster catchers which mm. kind of infections they have you could do many studies about them like comparing um, more coastal and more urban populations and then to see because you catch them consecutively over many years to see how their infections um, develop and, and how consistent these measures are i think there's some, actually something about this in swans in the UK, I seem to remember swan stuff. Okay, yeah, yeah, Must and be something, something in Se Seychelles waters as well. But they have very low, low diversity of parasites, which is yeah. quite long. But yeah, there's not a lot out there. It's interesting stuff. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no worries. Uh, any more questions from anyone? Adam. Yeah. Thank you. Um, very interesting talk. Uh, thanks a lot. Can can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hear okay. You. Okay. Uh, so very interesting talk. Uh, I would have two rather general questions and maybe naive. So so please forgive me if, if they're really naive questions. The first one is that uh, I'm wondering whether the fact that um, mamma mammalians and and humans uh, have enucleated erythrocyte erythrocytes. Um, compared to, to birds that have uh, nucleated the erythrocytes, whether, does, whether this can play any role in the immunological defense against um, um, plasmodium uh, infections, is, if there's anything, any hypothesis or, or data about this. So you mean whether um, the fact that birds have the nucleated erythrocytes, whether this changes the way they would um, they would fight a, a parasite infection compared to humans, how they would fight yeah, malaria exactly, infection. Because, because birds in general seem to cope mm. um, with malaria quite well, whereas in, in humans, malaria infection is a really severe um, uh, disease. And I don't know, and it is also known that uh, erythrocytes, even in, in uh, mammals, uh, have some immunological functions. Mm. Uh, so whether this has anything to do with the, the fact that birds seemingly cope better with, with malaria than humans do? Uh, as, a, as a first part of the answer, I would say I'm not even very sure whether you can just generally say that humans are struggling more from the infections than birds do, because oftentimes we study the infections of the, uh, the, the, the effects of the chronic infections. So if the birds have a primary infection, how many really die from these infections? How many have strong symptoms? I don't know whether we know a lot about it because like I showed in the symptom slide, 
um, many of these birds, they have a very reduced mobility. So these are not the birds we capture when we catch with um, mist nets. I think in the end, we know very little about primary infections and natural infections. We know something about the experimental infections done in canaries or in, in some experimental birds in the lab, but um, not a lot is known. And from the experimental infections, we actually know that the infections can be quite um, deadly often. Mm -hmm. So I would not say very much in general that um, avian malaria infections are much more benign than and okay. human malaria infections. And then it would be very interesting. Um, I don't know of any study that really compared nucleated and non-nucleated um, host erythrocytes and how um, there maybe could be a, a role of the erythrocyte in recognition or reaction to the, to the parasite once it is in the, in the erythrocyte cell. Yeah, well, it would be difficult because uh, like all, all birds uh, have uh, nucleated erythrocytes and all mammals have non-nucleated, so that's kind of... Cool. Still, I mean, it would be possible. I mean, it is, it is possible nowadays to really look at... We were talking about that uh, also at the malaria conference. Um, how, can, how can single cells be analyzed? How could, um, for example, that, that would be probably something for people interested in transcriptomics to really look at the the RNA or, or some kind of signaling uh, molecules that are going on within a single cell um, once it is infected and then compare uh, over the different taxa, host taxa, uh, how their cells actually react once a parasite is entering a cell. Mm -hmm. Well, actually that leads to, or it's related to my second question is that uh, again, I don't know much about this, but um, I read that um, um, the, the entry points where the plasmodium gets into the erythrocytes, there are some chemokine receptors and different parts where the, this uh, adherence happens. And that some parts in, in Africa where the malaria uh, infections are, are really common and it, it um, has a high toll on the population, then these receptors there's are, are different or non-existent in those populations where uh, compared to other populations where malaria is, is less uh, less of an issue so i was wondering whether these kind of uh, details again like on the erythrocytes on or on the receptors can be uh, or are studied in in birds uh, between species or even within a species i don't think that it's studied a lot um also because i mean like it, it, human malaria research is much more targeted on really the, the, the medical treatment or maybe also the, the prevention of like, because these entry points are always also the, the points where maybe a, a vaccine or something could also act on or where, whether a treatment could act on. And because this is not really a big topic for, for bird malaria, I don't think that it's studied a lot, but there might be some things that I don't oversee. Um, uh, and I don't hear of. I mean, as you as you saw, like stuff I'm doing <laughs> is mostly um, natural history stuff. It's mm -hmm. this uh, host parasite associations uh, within the bird malaria research. There are many more people um, that are working more on the immunological side. Um, I don't oversee this, but for sure, super interesting to 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 think about this, especially like the stuff you said about the nucleated and non-nucleated. I think there are so many differences between humans and birds that that could influence this whole um, interaction. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, no worries, thanks. <clears throat> okay, I think we might be out of time for questions unless there's a quick one. No, I think that might be it. So uh, once again, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much Tamara for uh, talking to us today and uh, yes, and good luck for the rest of your research. And yeah. I'll be in touch soon. That's it. For you too. Thanks yes. so much <laughs> and have a nice day, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. Goodbye.